Building your home recording studio. How anyone can create professional sounding audio. Hi, this is Ken Therio from Homebrew Audio. What do you think you'd have to do to record and produce professional sounding audio, whether that be music, voiceovers, etc.? Do you think you'd need expensive microphones and interfaces and other gear? Maybe you think the only alternative is to go to a commercial recording studio where the average hourly rate is $50. That's $50 an hour. Well, you're not alone. Most people do. The truth is that with some basic knowledge, and not even hard knowledge, you can get professional sounding audio with gear costing less than $100, assuming you already have a computer, a normal everyday computer. Before we talk about gear and how to set things up properly, this is really important to know. Good audio is not guaranteed. Just because you bought a Neumann, which is a really expensive microphone, and or Pro Tools HD, which is really expensive recording software. If you know what you're doing, you can get decent audio from the cheapest gear. And I'll give you four tips for doing this. But lack of knowledge causes lots of folks to produce really crappy audio, even with expensive gear. Now I want to throw out a disclaimer here. Better quality microphones and preamps and interfaces do cost more, and they can and do create audio that is superior than what you can get from, say, a plastic PC mic or something really cheap, but only if you know a bit about what you're doing. If you do know what you're doing, it is possible to produce better audio with a plastic PC mic than someone with no experience using a setup costing, wait for it, a hundred times more. How can I be so specific? Because during the first Homebrew Audio podcast, we compared the sound quality of some spoken word stuff made with gear costing $5 against a setup costing $500. The result was obvious, even to the most casual listener. The $5 studio setup was better, much better. If you'd like to hear that for yourself, check out our post where we put up two audio samples of what I'm talking about. There's a link to it in the navigation bar at homebrewaudio.com. So what are the basics of the home recording studio? By the way, I'm making an assumption here that we're not talking about a standalone um, VS880 type of home recording studio. We're talking about a computer-based home recording studio. So here are the basics. A microphone of some kind captures the sound. That sound is then converted into ones and zeros another way of saying digital audio, by some sort of sound card or interface. And then a recording program reads the digital audio, allowing you to edit and save, etc. We've designated two types of computer-based home recording studios. There's Configuration 1 and Configuration 2. Configuration 1 is a microphone plugged directly into the computer, either via the sound card or a USB port. Configuration 2 is a microphone plugged into an interface box or other third-party device designed to accept a standard three-pin microphone cable. And then that interface goes into the computer. Plus, there's mobile recording. So the most basic of basic studios will be a computer microphone plugged into a computer sound card, Configuration 1, along with some recording software on the computer. You can actually do that for about $5, but it would be really hard to get pro quality audio from that. So how do we improve audio quality regardless of what configuration we're using or what cost we're using? Yes, even with that $5 studio, there are some basics to getting the best quality audio out of whatever gear you have, however cheap. And it all comes down to noise, noise, noise. We fight the noise first we prevent as much of it getting into the recording as possible. One way to do that is to use a cardioid microphone. Another way is to get close to the microphone. Then we fight the noise again. Record as loud as you can without clipping, that means without distorting, which crowds out a lot of the system noise. And then fight the noise again. After it's been recorded, you use noise reduction tools and some other techniques to reduce the noise that got recorded, which, by the way, is inevitable. So those are the four tips, and we will talk about those in a little bit more detail. But why is fighting noise the best way to improve audio quality? Well, the biggest enemy of good audio is noise. 
but we have to think of noise as being something different from what you might normally think. We're not talking about just hiss and lawn mowers outside the window and barking dogs and electrical hum and static and all that stuff. Noise is anything that isn't the thing you are trying to record. That's called the signal. And noise can also include echoes of the signal, that sort of reverby sound you sometimes hear. This is usually referred to as room sound. So let's start with preventing the noise. In a perfect world, you'd have a great recording space where the room sound actually complements the signal. By the way, that's extraordinarily rare. Most home recording studios are in bedrooms or spare rooms in a house, which are basically rectangles or squares, and those are notoriously bad for producing room sound echo. So let's just assume you don't have a great recording space, because hardly anyone does. The second best option is to have a vocal isolation booth treated with materials that are designed to absorb echoes, allowing you to record only the signal significantly reducing the room sound noise. That option is fairly difficult to do right and can be fairly expensive, but let's take a look at some of these. Here are just a few examples of things you can do. You can buy a vocal booth that's uh, pre-made. One example here is the ClearSonic ISO pack. That's $1,100. Another option is something like the Aurelex Max Wall, which are basically modular pieces of acoustic foam that you can set up over microphone stands and create your own little room. Slightly less expensive at $999. And there's something like the Prime Acoustic Flexi Booth, which basically gives you three sides that you can adjust that will help absorb the sound and reduce room sound. Then there's something called the SC Electronics Reflection Filter, which is a semicircular baffle made of several different kinds of acoustic materials. You can set this up on a microphone stand, then just position it immediately behind the microphone, and it will not only absorb the sound coming out of your mouth, but it will also help prevent the reflected sound in the room from coming back into the mic. And there's something like the Harlan Hogan Porta Booth, which is $349, and that is something that's designed to be portable, so you can take it on the road with you. And as you can see from the picture here, it surrounds the microphone, doing pretty much the same job as the SE Electronics Reflection Filter. And then there's something that also does a similar job, but it doesn't have as many of the different kinds of acoustic materials as in the Reflection Filter, and that's the Prime Acoustic Vox Guard, which is about $90. So those are some of the best, albeit pretty expensive ways, to prevent noise getting into your recordings. But for many of us, it's often impractical or too expensive to have any of the above. Most of us do our recording in a spare bedroom, and bedrooms are notoriously great at producing bad echoes that when added to the signal, your voice, make the audio really bad. Sound bounces off the hard surfaces all over the room, combining with each other to amplify or even delete certain parts of the main sound. Then, all these different mutant versions of your voice arrive at the microphone, along with the direct signal, usually all at slightly different times. Ick. If you've watched a lot of internet videos where someone is narrating, you've almost certainly heard this. In fact, it is way too common that the video is really slick and professional looking, only to have poor audio layered over the top. Usually it sounds like the person is speaking in a bathroom or something, all echoey and reverby. In the case of talking head videos, this is caused by the fact that the narrator is almost always relying on the built-in camera mic, which is several feet away. So the first thing we have to do is deal with room noise before any sound reaches the mic. First thing you can do is use a mic with a cardioid pickup pattern. Fortunately, most mics default to that pattern. These mics record only what's in front of them. They reject the sound that comes from behind and most of the sound coming from the side. The next thing you can do is get your mouth close to the mic, like just a couple of inches. This will help the mic get mostly your voice, the signal, and less of the reflected sound, all those sounds bouncing off the walls, the noise. This is probably the most important thing you can do if your recording space is less than ideal. This is doubly true if you're shooting talking head video. Next, we make sure that we're recording as loud as possible without distorting or clipping. A lot of people make this mistake. They record their voice at a low level, and then they raise the level after the fact. 
The problem is that they're also raising the noise when they do this. So make sure to capture as high a level as possible of your voice in the first place. You can use the gain level on your interface, if you have one, or use the software mixer panel controls to do this. The next step in producing clean audio is to reduce the noise that will inevitably be in our recording when our rooms are less than perfect. The way to do that is to use tools in recording software called noise reduction. What noise reduction does is sample a section of the audio that is only noise from areas where there's no voice talking. So it knows what noise looks like and hence what to turn down. Then the program separates the noise from the signal and gets rid of it, ideally leaving the signal slash voice unaffected. That last bit is really hard to do. There is usually some artifact left behind after noise reduction is performed. It sounds like swirling water. So you have to play with the settings to find the right balance of noise reduction without making the signal sound too weird. If you do all three of those things, you can get the best possible audio out of the cheapest possible gear. It's what I did in the $5 versus $500 thing. That's the first answer to the question of how we move toward pro audio from the $5 setup, having a basic understanding of how to limit noise. Now we can address step two of recording basics, the part where sound is converted to ones and zeros, or digital audio, by a sound card or interface. This is the main reason why the $5 plastic mic going into a sound card is not the best idea. The microphone is very limited in how accurate it can be, since the components are small and cheap and tend to be oversensitive to certain sounds, like P-pops and rumble and other low-frequency stuff, and not sensitive enough to others. Then comes the fact that the analog-to-digital converters built into integrated sound cards of most computers are of poor quality. Then to top it all off, integrated sound cards tend to pick up a lot of the electrical noise from the motherboard. So the best first step then is to avoid having to plug a microphone into an integrated sound card. The fastest and most inexpensive way to do this is to use a USB microphone, which will have digital converters built right into it, making for better quality conversion and avoiding much of the computer noise. But the small headset USBs, the ones that are under $25 usually, are still really small and have the same accuracy and frequency response limitations as other PC mics. This next upgrade is where you move into the realm of professional quality audio. You can improve the sound greatly by moving from the tiny USB headset mic to larger USB mics, like the Samson Q1U, for only a few dollars more than the typical headset USB mic. It costs about $49. You can then incrementally improve sound quality by moving to a large diaphragm condenser USB mic like the Samson C01U, which is about $80. Prices go up from there for large diaphragm condenser type USB mics. By the way, you can pick up either of these mics at most Best Buy stores. I find that even with the larger USB mics, you still get a low level hiss, usually so low you can only hear it in headphones, but still, a bit more than you'd want to have if you were sending a voiceover job to a client. But noise reduction programs usually can fix this quite well. That's because the hiss is very low level and it's a very consistent kind of noise. That brings up another point about audio quality. With the basic knowledge we've been talking about, you can get top-notch audio quality from inexpensive gear, but it may take more time than if you had the expensive gear. Having to run noise reduction on everything is one example. This is fine, though, for a lot of people, as they frequently have more time available than cash. Then, as you can afford to, you can upgrade your studio in increments, but only if you need to. For most people, a large USB mic will give them as much audio quality as they will ever need. So, that's Home Recording Studio Configuration 1, a microphone going directly into a computer. You can enter the pro level of audio quality here but only if you have a USB mic that's larger than the headset type. 